Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you might be. I am Nicole BC, and you, you and us have everything. everything. Welcome. I am so excited to have Kitty Baroque here with us today. Kitty has inspired me since I met her, which I think was like two years ago, Kitty, believe it or not. Uh, It kind of blows my fucking mind. (laughs) I started this interview series and I called it The Relatables for a reason. I wanted to talk to the people who inspire me in my everyday life. And that is not to say that these are everyday people. I like to think they're all very unique and very special. You know, again, I wanted to, I wanted to talk to people that I felt like would really inspire you, the listener, and someone that you can relate to, somebody that you feel like has stood in your shoes or is potentially even walking in your shoes right now. And that's why I love Kitty. I mean, there are a million thousand hundred reasons that I love Kitty. And when I said, like, how do you want me to introduce you? Kitty was like, I'm just a multi-passionate being trying to figure out how to make a go of things. And I love that because for all of us, multi-passionate, multi-hyphenate, serial entrepreneurs, creatives, idealists, visionaries, dreamers, rule breakers, trailblazers, rebels, we can can absolutely relate to (laughs) having lived at least nine lives, if not many, many more, having lived in multiple hemispheres, countries, continents, communities, and not just having, you know, reinvented ourselves or been forced to start over and start again, but like industry agnostic. Kitty's experience, her creativity, her artistry, her curiosity breaks all of the rules. And so I'm going to, I'm going to stop jibber jabbering. Oh, and I also need to apologize to everybody. I don't believe in being sick, but there's something occurring here, which probably doesn't sound amazing. (laughs) And so if I sneeze or if this starts to sound even more nasally, uh, apologies. Also, sorry, not sorry. The the show will go on. So with that, Kitty, why don't you... (laughs) say whatever it is you need to say at this moment, but also tell us about your origin story because that is one of, Kitty's one of those people that every time you talk to her, she's got an experience that relates to it. She's probably worked that job. <laughs> like, <laughs> she may have an advanced degree at it. She probably performed it on stage. Like it's unbelievable to me. So Kitty, I would love to learn much, much more about your story because it, you have endlessly fascinated me since the day that I met you. So. I will now pass the microphone. Uh, Well, firstly, let me say thank you for having me on here. I feel incredibly grateful and honoured, and it's the popping of the cherry for me for my podcast. So that's kind of like, I would say, so I'm from South London. I You probably can't hear it in my accent right now. Uh, (laughs) I grew up to working class parents, really doing it tough. My dad worked for himself in a business. Um, He was very, um, this will probably play into my mindset exactly perfectly well. He was very anti the man, Um, didn't want to work for anyone, wanted to do his own thing, um, regardless of how, you know, tough it was and really wanted to do the best for his family at the same time, but definitely wasn't willing to compromise his values. And maybe there's some stuff to work around that for me as well. You know, I had ways to, I had coping strategies to make myself feel safe in the world. And I was familiar with that. So yeah, just, <clears throat> just so I could go to a different college, I pretended I wanted to do drama. I had not got enough confidence to do, do drama, but from there I met my best friend who was French. And, um, I feel like that expanded my literary horizons we got to like learn about Ibsen and Chekhov and I was like got to play do soliloquies from the cherry tree and we wrote a play together and that was kind of fun so you do a pre a year of preschool before you get into degree I didn't get into the college I wanted to get into to do fine art I wanted to be like Van Gogh everyone kept telling me to do illustration I really wanted to be like here I am I'm, I want to be Rembrandt like that's really easy for me um I don't know we all think like that when we're like 19 right and um so I went to this college I didn't really want to go to and it was like the rejects college but again it was partly private the good thing about it being partly private was 
I got a scholarship to go there. Again, hashtag blessed life or call it growing up in the 80s when things were a little bit easier. And there was a lot of exposure there to interesting people. One of the guys uh, was a guy called Matt. Um, I can't remember his name, but I seem to remember he was Polish. And he almost pioneered the um, art gallery scene in East End. Like wow. he had all these really cool, weird contemporary artists. And I have to tell you, I hated them all. It was like, <laughs> what is this stuff? That is not what I thought you were going to say. I don't know what this stuff is. I'm not interested. Yay to meeting all these really super cool, famous people. Yay to being part of that cool crowd. But I'm a figurative painter, right? I draw from life just think this person wants to be Rembrandt that's the easiest yeah, way to yeah, think about it right yeah. but what I will say is that expanded like my mindset just a little bit so there's like yeah I'm still on this path but I'm open to exploring other journeys and I want to be part of this new world you know whatever this new world is and so my best friend and I decided to apply for the most prestigious art college and it was one of those things where they only take like they'll usually only have a very few places most people will go from their degree to their postgrad straight away um, at the same college like there's no spaces for anyone from any other colleges because the standards are super high it's university college london slate school of art huh. at the time which was very big for figurative painters yeah. So my best friend and I applied. We had kind of different styles. And all I remember is being at our other college and her getting an acceptance letter and I just had to leave crying because I was like, that's it. It's not going to happen for me. Like there's only one spot. Like da 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 da. And fast forward, so I got in too. So both of us got in too. Oh, oh my god! I know, you told right? Climax. <laughs> was so, I was like, I oh, know. It's the sad part of the story, and then you're like, no. Oh. And then we got in. <laughs> I know. And then we and then we got in. That is kismet. Yeah. It was just so, that. and we were very different people. Her her, fam- her favorite artists are Bonnard and uh, Rothko, so very kind of like different way of painting. Yeah. Um, and we had some really amazing teachers. Like uh, it, you may not know any of these people, but a guy called Patrick Simons, a guy called Ewan Uglo, he's got stuff in the Tate. He's very well known worldwide um so all these people were people we were having you know glass of wines with and hanging out all these kind of really core british painters and so i was buried in that life with all these kind of wealthy kids and things are very different for like a working class girl in that environment you know we didn't have parents and things but i had talent and i think talent can kind of get you a lot of the way through uh so from there i won a lot of awards through that time i'd say like music was my biggest journey still like i can remember inventing projects just so i could get to paint with headphones in like i would like paint otis redding while listening to otis redding because i really just wanted to listen to otis redding um and so art was like really entangled with my music but more as a inspiration less of a visual. So a lot of my stuff is uh, figurative, like very clear cut. And if you were to ask me an influence for my art, it would be like early Italian Renaissance. So I like stuff with very block colour, very clear line. And I just remember I was getting into all these weird and wacky kind of stuff and starting to read old school kind of new age people like, you know, Louise Hay or Wayne Dyer. Um, So the OG crowd. And so that kind of journey was kind of part of it because it was part of being vegetarian at the time and recycling and caring about the environment before it was cool. So were you a new age hippie? Were you like part of the OG new age, new age? No, 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 no. Cause I okay. love fashion too much. So <laughs> I like when I used to go to art school, I would like dress up for the art. I was never the girl in the jeans, like with the paint everywhere. I was always like looking in the, in 
what I thought were the coolest outfits. There I mean, go. I did do disco dancing and like it back in the day and like had my sand pants and won medals for that. <sighs> See, so. this is why you're fascinating. <laughs> Just going to drop in there. Used to do disco. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love dancing so much. So I think in another life I would have become a singer and a musician. And, you know, I love singing. That's like, that's my soul thing. Um, I think I'll jump a little bit. So when I left uni, my final year, I won a major scholarship and decided to go to Italy with the money. And I lived with a family in Italy for a while. I had about a year before that, I had an Italian boyfriend. So that was a good way to learn Italian. And he dumped me because, you know, non-Italian girl, Italian like Italians. <laughs> it's not kind of the way. Yeah. Um, but I loved Italian art, and so that's why I wanted to go. So I lived in Arezzo for a while uh, with a family looking after their daughter, like between five and eight, and then just going around all these fantastic parts of Italy. And that's where I met my partner in a youth hostel in Florence on the way home at Christmas. And I saw this guy and I was like, that's the guy I'm going to marry. And he was like chatting to all these Latin American kind of girls. And he was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Like, don't even <laughs> think about it. Um, he's Morty from New Zealand. He was doing the whole Australian New Zealander travels the world thing, you know, hanging out with cool chicks, you know. Uh, he came to hang out with my parents we lived in London for seven years and then we just decided we were poor we were tired of being poor in London so we come to Australia and be poor here instead um and so that's how I found myself here but amidst that there you know there are the office jobs there are the going to galleries and being told how to paint and me being very arrogant and saying like to Bond Street galleries, no, I'm not going to paint like that. Don't you know who this I am? Is how I paint. Like, yeah, exactly. Um, and I worked as an Italian speaking receptionist there. My dad told me to do admin. I had been seeing a, so the wellness journey was continuing and I had been seeing an acupuncturist as his case study. And he said, well, look, if you're moving to Australia, maybe you should think about studying natural therapies because you're obviously interested in it and when I moved here there was a course where you could do module by module and they had an uh, anatomy course and I thought hey look I'm not losing anything I'll just do the anatomy course and um, that'll be good for my artwork anyway and doing stuff like that and I ended up doing all of the modules and became a shiatsu therapist and a Japanese okido yoga teacher which is huh. a partner yoga partner in laughter and animal yoga based on shiatsu and acupressure principles and stuff so never knew that uh, the this the kitty story <laughs> continues to, <laughs> to oh it's really me. good it's a really fun form of yoga actually but it does require on partner work a lot and the i i think then this remains to be the eternal challenge i, I don't want to be a therapist but i also need to have the art in there and yeah. so I found when I was teaching yoga and I was doing shiatsu, it was too intense for me. I did not want to take on people's problems. I apologize, people. Um, everyone was coming to me with these big cancer parent parental stories. And I was like, I, I don't know what this is. I can't deal yeah. with it. I don't want to do that. Uh, so I ended up going into the day job. Still so I awesome have day. this whole passion for learning. If I'm not learning or reading, then you know something's up, right? Um and I decided, well, hey, maybe I try and use my creativity because I didn't have an income. I only have wealthy parents. I had to kind of figure my way out. So like my brain was trying to figure out how can I kind of find my way through this world. So I studied interior decoration oh, okay. and I became like a color consultant. I worked blending colors, helping people with their houses, helping architects, all that kind of stuff. And then I was like, yeah, this is great. But now I'm missing the wellness part and no one wants color in their house. They only want mushroom or the right oh, shade God, of light. Oh God, or fucking gray. If I go into another gray house, I swear, I don't know if that's 
that was happening in Oz when I left. I think people were doing just like the whole gray and white thing, but far out, far out. I mean, there's well, this not is a, a rental, right? So, like, I'm yeah. sorry, it looks like an <laughs> a cell right I mean, here. Look, oh, I'm like, I'm like in vanilla land right now, so no judgment. Uh, Hashtag I know, judgment. I know. Most I know. people are it's listening anyway. Somewhat ironic, but you know, we bring the color. That's you know. There you rolls. go. I, I, uh, I'm also wearing gray. Okay, okay. <laughs> Back to your story, please. Um, so yeah, I, um, so I studied interior decoration, big things happened in my life. My partner had a car accident, uh, was a hit and run. He's lucky he came out. Okay. He can walk and talk, but essentially he hasn't been able to work for about 13, 14 years. So that's ongoing. So that, that happened. That was pretty major. I ended up getting a temp job at a TV station, which turned into a 14 year career, uh, which I left uh, as an executive assistant. So organizing and keeping everyone happy. So it's kind of ringing bells, but like multi everything person. So dealing with talent, dealing with big events, dealing with sponsor things, uh, trying to do the creative and wellness thing at Hulk on the side. And I think shortly after my partner was sick, I had like an accident where I got a hip injury that I still am working through. Um, then my father passed away in the UK. My mum passed away a few years later. And it was just like a sequence of like horrible events called life that we yeah. all find ourselves trying to navigate the best we can and usually trying to push through in that very Western I'd love to say I have all these tools and I implement them all. Sometimes we don't, right? And uh, I was doing my best to figure it out. I wasn't really in meditation at that stage, but when my mum passed away, if I start talking now, I still think I've got stuff to work through because when you live far away from family, it's tough. And when you haven't been able to afford to go and see family and there were challenges with my sister and... That was like a really big thing for me and that took me back to yoga. So I ended up going back into yoga studio. I happened to go to this great studio in Melbourne that had launched with this really innovative sound concept. I met some, a few years before that, I had met some friends via iTunes and fallen in love with this artist, Adam Lambert. So Sting's now like, He's 15 years, 10 years year older than me, so I figured I can go 15 years younger. There you go, 100%. Quite easily. Yeah. Um, and so I, I did have friends in that community, like we'd go travelling around following him around Australia. Um, and so I had like music kind of to soothe my soul, if you like. I was going to yoga to try and figure out what this broken kind of concept that when you lose both parents and you have no family and you're in a country where you don't really have a strong friend network, life's tough, right? And uh, I just, I feel like Australia is one of those countries where it's really hard to make friends and maybe that's just my perception of it. So I found myself figuring out my life after my mum passed away, not having that strong family connection and yoga became my family. I guess that's the way I can describe it. I had this phenomenal teacher who then moved to India and we were all devastated and um, fast forward to her moving back to Australia and then I decided just before COVID to take a teach training and then, yay, COVID, can't teach, especially I'm in Victoria, second most locked down place in the world, um, 265 days or some crazy amount of time like that with the most insane restrictions. And so I found myself home. I did two years of mentorship with her online. She started, she has this amazing community called The Light Collective Yoga. I learned traditional pranayama, a lot of divine feminine practices. And I guess if we fast forward it to now, I had to make a really tough decision to leave my job. That was really difficult for me because I felt like it just wasn't in my value set. I feel like a lot of people after COVID made changes and yeah. I was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm exhausted. And it was a really tough choice because I did have some money, thankfully, from my mum passing that I could kind of tap into. Um, but that continues to be a really tough challenge because I think when you stop, 
your body just goes, oh, this is what we yeah. need you to do. And I'm maybe 15 months in or something of living that and I'm only just now starting to feel like I'm coming out of the woods and realising but if I don't have my value set, I have nothing. And I'm so glad that my dad, if we go back to the beginning of the story, is like, screw the man. Um, like, you know, be a good human, be kind to everyone. And I'm so thankful for having that gene of his. And I've realized through a lot of things that have happened, especially over the last 15 months, that I can't, I can't allow myself to be pushed around anymore. And who I am isn't one thing. It's all this mesh of or mush of music and da 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 da, da. Um, And I have to feel into what that looks like and what life as a multi-passionate kind of weird human who cares very much about humanity but quite honestly hates humanity right now. Um, and I'm meant to be here on, like, my Caro put it so well. She said, you're basically a human who loves humans. You're here to love humans. And right now you hate them. And you're trying to figure out how to love them again. And I just thought it was just a really good, succinct kind of way to explain that kind of, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm coming back to listening to my voice. What does my voice need? Let me shut out everything else. And so while things like social media and technology and all those things have been, I've always been one of those people who's always wanted the latest tech, but I'm not techie. I can only relate to it in terms of a creative kind of outlet. And somehow after the pandemic, I became involved in a project called The Awakened Woman and I learned how to buy an NFT and that was like the beginning of my NFT journey. I'm still figuring out the crypto or money side of that but that was the beginning of my like now I know how to buy an NFT. I know what a wallet is. I know how to be secure and so all of this is just I guess demonstrates the natural curiosity and I haven't even mentioned things like how I got to meet Sting and have dinner with him, how I ran the London Marathon because Sting was running in it and I decided the day before and I'd never done any training. God, I couldn't walk for about two weeks. And then I did a Brené Brown course with Oprah and Oprah's people approached me to use one of my artworks and I said no. So those are the kind of headlines. That I love that origin story. And the reason I wanted <laughs> you to share that and that – I love that you ended with like the highlight reel. I think a lot of us can relate to it. I think a lot of us have lived multifaceted, multi-hyphenate, multi-passionate lives. And it doesn't, it doesn't fit into an Instagram headline. It doesn't show up as a SEO friendly LinkedIn summary. And mm -hmm. I think so many of us struggle because like you said, we're being forced or punished because we can't come up with an elevator pitch for ourselves. And, you know, I hope that anybody listening recognizes like you don't have to. <laughs> so I've never been like, I've never been like, this is the thing. This has to be the thing. This is my career for the next hundred years. I know I'm, I'm amazing at painting, but that's like, so what? I paint a picture and it goes in some rich dude's house. Like that's not, that doesn't, that's not me either. So it's that figuring out how to meld all those things together and maybe I'll figure it out. Maybe I won't. And life is happening in the middle of all those things. And I'm really not, I've really just let go that it's like a, the prison of who we have to be and who everyone is telling us we have to be. And I guess learning things like human design realizing kind of like, oh, wait, I get to be that human and I can be that human who's like initiating change. And, you know, employment looks like having 10 streams of things that come into this giant bundle. And I just think that it, it's that, like be willing to explore and get curious about your life and leaning to the random things that happen because they're never random, firstly. And I, I think the more you create space for practices like meditation, I know this is so boring and it's, but meditation can be cooking. It can be baking. It can oh, be, yeah, 100%. it's how you live it your can life. Be painting. Right? 
Yeah. Yes. Or walking the streets with awareness yep. or being present with someone. Like, so when you say meditation, everyone's like, oh, and this is where you get into your diary of a CEO. Everyone's always like, the answer is meditation. Yeah. That's, that's like where I'm at. Not that I'm choosing to opt out of the game of life. Not that I'm choosing to opt out of feeling, but I'm choosing to opt out of this structure that says everything has to look a certain way for me because I'm this age or I'm, you know, in this situation or I live in this country or, and there, there isn't that. Um, and I'm telling you all these things like they're easy. None, none of this has been easy for me. No, but, but you again, know? like this is what people need to hear that there's other people asking these questions. This is how I got into the arts and then entrepreneurship and then nonprofits and then business to me, like, why start your own business? Why be an entrepreneur so that you can create your own structure? And everybody's going to tell you it's impossible. Everybody's going to tell you you can't. Everybody's going to force you using fear to fit into their box. But to me, like the, the, the biggest benefit of saying like, I'm a business owner, I'm in business. Like when I distill it down to its, to its simplest form, it's that I'm taking this seriously externalizing like the capitalist patriarchal, you know, money centric value uh, that we we've used to translate worth (laughs) and success quote unquote in business. But it, it to me is saying I have agency, I have choice and Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to do it my way. And I might fuck it up over and over and over again. I might do 50 hundred different things, but that's okay. Because it's my business and I'm like, this is mine. And uh, that's, you know, I talk about it being for like the trailblazers and the rule breakers and the rebels. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And I think that's what the more air quotes artist has always been uh, defined as. And a question that I ask some of my people because they wouldn't define themselves as an artist I think we might know the answer with you, but maybe not. Like, how do you feel about that structure and label and definition for you? Uh, That's a really charged word for me. Um, Yeah. Hey, you started with the tough stuff, so I'm leading (laughs) in. (laughs) Um, That's a charged word for me because that word is used very liberally. Uh, So I would say at the moment I'm like, where are the artists? Where are the musicians speaking out? You know, do you have a mu- definition for artists? Maybe that's a different way of asking it. If you, if I'm applying it to a painting or a song, it, it's something that taps into that emotional felt sense. It, like it takes over your body. It transports your brain to another space and time. You can feel what the artist felt. You don't have to be told. When I, when I told you about the East End Gallery thing, you don't have to have a big list of what this work is about on the wall. If you're doing a great job, I should feel it from looking at the artwork, like if it's a visual piece. Um, and it's the same with music for me. And I feel like that sense of artistry or master status, when he comes with a lot of work, I would really struggle to call myself that even. And if you look at people like Picasso or, um, you know, I don't know, Rembrandt maybe, but a lot of those people wouldn't even use that word to describe themselves. You mentioned flow and you know, things are right when it's just like, boop, 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 boop. Uh, I typically ask people about their creative process and about their work. I'm going to, I have a bad habit of doing 18 part questions. So I'm going to circle back to the work part, but how do you know when you're in flow? I feel like the word, the world is still and I'm present. Ooh, like okay. everything magic just happens. Yeah. I can't explain it other than that, than that. I get an urge to do something in the quickest way possible. I will tell you that when I moved to Australia, I Sting was coming to perform at the local theater near me and I wrote a fan letter to Sting 
And then I wrote a professional letter to say how he inspired me and how I do this artwork and I'd love to paint him. I had this intuition. I was doing a temp job. I put them both in the same envelope. My sister-in-law came to the show. We saw the show. We went backstage. She was rolling her eyes at me, like waiting at the stage door, like normal. Obviously, he got out of the door straight into the car. No, no, like meet and greets, nothing like that. And there was this tiny gap in the window. And I had this little art folio that I put together with my letter. I threw it. It went through the gap, landed in the car. The next day I got a call from Kim Turner, who was Sting's manager, saying Sting loves your work and wants to meet you. And then from there there was a whole heap of like experiences over two days that would have been like beyond my wildest dreams as a Sting fan growing up, like, you know. And so it's things like that. It's like suddenly there'll be a job offer or suddenly there'll be a conversation or suddenly I'll find myself in this room and it might be an awful experience. It might teach me something about myself. That's also flow. Flow doesn't have to be joy. Flow can be the universe rolling out the red carpet for this awful experience. Yeah. (laughs) Like so of resilience, I could argue it was really easy for me to go down that victim track you know my parents have passed away my partner's doing this I'm supporting sometimes some days I find myself still in that that conversation comes in the back of my head and I'm like no like think of all the gifts that I've had from this experience as tough as tough as it has been like think of the way I've got back up think of the way I'm still up Think of the tough decisions I've made. Think of the way I've held my integrity together. So sometimes flow is how well, like that cheesy thing they always say, how do you act when no one's looking? It's all those things. How do I feel about myself? How have I held myself? And that that's flow because then my soul is here. I'm in tune. I am clearing the noise out of the way. So it's like clearing the antenna in your daily practice or going sitting in nature for like stuff to come in your brain. Like Liz Gilbert calls it the daemons or whatever, the the spirits that just come in your brain. Here's an idea. Here's an idea. And how about you do that? It's like if I tune out the noise and I tune in, that's when I can hear the flow. And when it's an artwork, it's just like the artwork just makes itself through my hand and I have no idea how I did that, but now it looks like Rembrandt for argument's sake. I still hold uh, on to these fantasy. <laughs> that, well, this is a leading question. I normally let people ask it for themselves. So if this doesn't resonate, correct me, please. Mm-hmm. But for someone who's multi-passionate and also for someone who, let's say, defines themselves as a creative, they might not have mm-hmm. earned the term artist yet, but that is their focus and their goal. Mm-hmm. Yet we have to eat. We have to pay the bills. We have to pay the rent. We have to take care of our partners or our parents or our children or whatever it might be. And so we have work, but it is not our work. It is not the work, if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you believe your work is to create the space or the container for this flow? So I have this random idea bubbling in my brain around wanting to empower women in this in my situation, who might be on a low income bracket, who can't access wellness tools, they can't access coaching, they can't easily access artwork. Now we can all do any of these things. There's a where there's a will, there's a way, right? But if we're in a country where it's thirty dollars to go to a yoga class, um, and maybe people can't find good resources because not everything great is on YouTube. Um, but they don't even have the accessibility to physically get to a yoga Maybe class. they don't even have that, right? Yeah. So at the moment, like the, the best definition I can put around that is creating mini containers or mini spaces where I get to dance between creating artwork, creating an experience or a circle, teaching real deal pranayama or um, – and that's arguable as well. You've got to keep kind of working on that stuff. There's a thousand different like versions of just allowing all the skills that I've collated to kind of come into one space where I get to choose what sings at one point in time. So I think it's literally just expression of whatever comes through to support others, but not with them in mind, with me in mind. 
I'm not interested in taking someone through a six months journey. I don't want to support you for nine months on. This is like at the moment my brain is in that headspace. Yeah. Because there's not that that that's not who I am. I'm not an art therapist, but I want to help facilitate those conversations and I really want to create something that is accessible that I have done work about being, I don't even like this word, but trauma-informed, culturally informed, Yeah. that I am not stepping on other people to climb a ladder because the ladder is not of interest to me. Um, so it's all about the expression and the co-creation of great experiences and trusting that whatever drops in is going to be the way. So I don't really have the answer other than that whatever comes through at the time. Well, I'm going to try to, to link this together because one of the things I also find fascinating about you is, is despite some of the, uh, you know, more air quotes, everybody, hardships that you've been through, mm-hmm. uh, you have continued to stay curious. And so this will be a two-part question. How did you get through the hard stuff. And you, you mentioned earlier, like you've, you've made the hard calls over and over again. You described it as the flow isn't always joy. Sometimes it's this really colorful experience, shall we say. And, you know, one of the reasons you and I connected as well is this fascination with technology, even though we're not, you know, developers and tech people, so I've, in the short time that I've known you, I've seen you embrace the hard stuff. I've seen you make really hard calls. And I've seen you do things that a lot of people who probably would relate to some of your externalized circumstance, being a caretaker for a partner, um, being in a generation or from a, a time and place where you wouldn't consider yourself to be tech forward or even crypto forward, yet you are an NFT collector. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you're... you're uh, yeah. So to, to kind of sum it up, like how did you get through the hard stuff and how do you continue to say yes to things that a lot of people who are in your shoes are like, that's not for me. I can't dot, dot, dot. Well, when I was talking to you about this idea at the moment, it's formulating in my brain as an NFT. It's like $5 Ooh. a month or something like that. That's like a quarterly membership. So it's actually formulating in that tech world. I have a template for you. So that- <laughs> when you're ready, you let me know. It's already built. All I need is a, that- is a piece, a picture to represent it. We can get it to go. Oh, great. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like. It's a go with the flow kind of situation. Um so I'm thinking about it now in that technology way because really it's it's almost like a technology can be this incredibly amazing thing and like almost a tangible consciousness. I was listening to a um I can't I don't ask me to idea it was one of that Tyson guy, what's his name? Neil deGrasse Tyson was doing an interview on stage with this super scientist quantum guy. And they discovered that the actual language of the universe was like one ones and zero zeros, which is exactly the same as computer coding. So that the the universe is coded as a matrix, if that makes sense. And that they discovered, like literally discovered actual code in the coding of the universe, uh, which was something that kind of blew my mind a little bit, just not being scientific, but just hearing that part. So I feel like, there's just so much room in crypto and Web3 for creating the equity because I realise that I'm in an incredibly privileged situation, but I can't beat myself up about that. It's like how can I elevate others and how can we create a more equitable world and how can I say, no, that's not in my name, this this. This atrocity, this statement, this thing is not in my name. I am not part of that because, you know, this colour of my skin holds me back or my upbringing holds me back. But I have been through so many tough times and I feel like having a lot of these challenges, I'm not comparing myself in any way to anyone who's been through anything that's far worse than that. But I am saying that I've always tried to keep my heart open. And so because of that, I've gone, okay, I've I've been through that. It's okay. I'm back again. Like uh, just having those experiences that you, you can write your life story and go, wait, I actually, I actually did that. How did I do that? Or how did I come through? So it's acknowledging things that you've already done 
it's um, having some routine, but not a routine that you are really oppressing yourself with and beating yes. yourself up yes. with yes. because I am yep. great at beating myself up. In, in I have a doctorate at beating myself up for things. So my work, even still, and the noise will still continue and the noise continues for many people. It's never like I've beaten that noise like now. It's the thing is always a thing and that's what I'm kind of realising is like, oh, okay, I didn't do my practice this morning. That's interesting. What's yeah. another way I could get the energy of that? Oh, I can go for a walk and I can take my shoes off in the park even if I'm in the middle of a city and I can just quiet, close my eyes, let the grass do its work and you don't even need to consciously tune in. To be honest, if you just take your shoes off and walk on the park or go to the beach and walk or whatever piece of ground you have, it doesn't even matter, just to allow yourself to stop in that moment. I think that's been the most helpful thing for me. So allow, I think allowing that curiosity to lead, what's the next feel good moment? What's the next feel good moment? And okay, I'm in this shit time. What, what thing can I do every day that is like a feel better thing? Maybe that's watching Real Housewives. Sometimes that's what it is. And if that's the thing, don't beat yourself up about that. But really leaning into those self-care things it has been the way forward for me and connecting with community. And I think finding, you, you were talking about the technology piece, it is that kind of community for me. So online communities are my jam. I love connecting with people. I love learning about their story, but I also love to interject. <laughs> Maybe I need a bit more listening in there. Uh, I love to tell people how to do things, but I don't want people to tell me how to do things. So there's a message in there for me somewhere. But I'm passionate about online community. And I think finding this first NFT connected with me because it's artwork. It's also community. It's also that wellness piece. So it's tying all those things together. The projects that I become involved with are all women who are doing social change things. They have like a real social benefit component. They're not saviors of the world, but they really genuinely want to change things and they genuinely want to create a more equitable world and just by their project existing whether it makes money or not it's irrelevant almost it's making a change in others life right it's not about the cash so that's where that like oh this makes sense to me like I can be in my room but still connected to community so I was really lucky to find that I dropped into the community where you and I met that was all around that social kind of media how we share our voice, all that kind of thing that got tricky for me when, you know, there were a lot of algorithm changes and, of course, I hate the man. We'll go back to that story. So I'm like, why am I giving you more data? I don't want to give you more data. I want to create my own community. I want to have my own enclosed space. I want people to journey with me. And so Web3 and all that crypto stuff made sense. The learning curve, get, I guess, was made easier through it being part edu educational in the first NFT. I then got, was lucky enough to get a scholarship for Shifi, um, which is a 13 week incredible community and overview, I guess, on all things Web3 and crypto in a very girl friendly, but very smart way. And there are some incredibly smart humans in that community and it's ongoing. It's super affordable at 300 USD and they always have scholarships. So I think that the whole intention of that program is like lock solid. I got to name one of the, the units, which is socially devoted to you, which is the social media, decentralized social media. So I was like, whoop, whoop. Like I got I to name that. a unit. And then I'm just going to honor and thank you for introducing me to Crypto Academy and Anthony Pompiano and learning all the tech things and other aspects of it. And then the, I guess I call the project that you've done with Noah and 
um, Nora and you, as a more an energy of crypto <laughs> thing. It feels like it's a more like, so now I have all the information I have the understanding about the security. I understand the freedom aspect of it, which is like freedom such an overused word. And I realize I've had a lot of freedom and I also have a lot of no freedom. And I think that we're at a really critical point where we need the artists, we need the truth tellers, we need the freedom people, we need the love people, we need the no, this is not okay people. It's just like I, I probably sound like the creative rebel. It kind of fits within my creative rebel genre really well. It taps into the energy side of it. It's I don't see a limitation of age in that world in the same way. And I think we can all put limitations on ourselves. I could sit here and tell you that I'm too old for X, Y, and Z as well. So I can sit with the limitation as we all can with whatever our things are, but we can also choose the expansion. And I feel like there's so much opportunity. If I think about growing up in my Gen X era, I loved it. I love my records. I love analog life. And I think being of that generation gives me a really unique viewpoint. Like I always, I really always come back to no one ever talks about Gen Xs because we're the rebels and we know what life is like analog and we also know digital. So you can't mess with us. Like we know how precious life is to hold on to in the non-digital. We know what integrity is. We know what changing the planet looks like. We know what artistry is. We know what saving the world looks like. But we're also willing to dive, dip our toes into this tech stuff. So I feel like... It gives me that ability to be that bridge and like just, it's such a huge space for opportunity, but it, there is, I, I guess they're definitely still a learning curve and I'm still leading into a learning curve. But um, I have lots of NFTs that probably have made me no money. In fact, they probably lost me money. Um, but I have um, been part of some amazing communities and the community is still there. And so I've, I've come out on top when I've purchased it because I've purchased because it's making an impact or I believe in this community. And so all those things I already got on the purchase. So the other stuff was an aside for me. You know. Well, I love every single second of that, Kitty. And thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing everything. I love how you've tied technology back into community, how you've managed to find your people, even though you struggled to find your people, how you have broken through the constraints and labels that so many of us place upon ourselves. And, you know, I, I've said like every belief is a limiting belief mm -hmm. and it's pretty easy to get caught up in all of those narratives and all of those stories. So that's again, one of the reasons you endlessly fascinate and inspire me so, I mean, we've been chatting for a minute. Uh, I feel like this might be a nice place to conclude. I just want to quote you because you said you've lived a life lived in curiosity. And something you had said to me before we hit record was, and music is the heartbeat. Yeah, I think that's still true. I still I just love that like so much. Headphones in, belting a song out, there is like, nothing about it like there is and it makes so much sense to me now I know about yoga and chanting and all those things because yeah. your voice so take this into the world I guess as a final message your voice whatever you want to go out there and share whatever conversations you want to have with people singing in the shower your voice is the healing balm for your body it doesn't matter how it sounds to anyone else it's built, it's inbuilt to readjust, realign the energy of who we are. And every, every vibration, I guess, sends out to the divine consciousness to create the collective vibration. So when we're looking at something external, it's like, wait, that's the mirror, right? What's happening within me? that this is happening in the world outside. Can I, like, look at myself from that perspective? What am I not? So using the music as the tool for healing, like, for me, transformational. I couldn't agree more. I mean, music was my lifeline when I, when I was sick and thought I was dying. Like, it is the thing that connected me to myself and my experience and my humanity and to others. 
it is such a powerful, powerful tool. One of our uh, compatriots, Walea, aka Wally, I call her mm-hmm. Wally, is writing a book on iconicism, and she is presenting a argument, opinion on musicians being the most iconic of artists because they span visual, textile, performance, writing, words, like, you know, the whole thing. And I'm assuming you might just agree with her on that. Well, because uh, you get to move the energy in your body. And actually I I commented on one of her posts yesterday because she's responsible for getting me into BTS. And um, you all should go and watch Jungkook um, standing next to you video incredible mj vibes to the max you've got to watch it um so willie is responsible for getting me into bts but you know again it goes back to the vocal the dance like i'm um, um, forever michael jackson disco it's you know it's a thing for me so yeah that's really well i suppose strong. before we go are there any creators digital musical visual words movement but any place you want to send our listener uh, okay so I'll, co- I'll commit to doing a little email newsletter and i'll somehow Ooh. like send the link but it's via a platform called pencil boots okay. um it's really just like you can just send four images so it's based basically for artists or visual people you can do 120 characters per image but it's not a whole newsletter it's literally just i could just send four images with one sentence and i could just do that once a month pencil booth pencil booth that oops that is and yeah for i think for up to 100 users you don't pay so maybe i'll do something like i do 100 people and that's all you get so so i don't know what i'm building i don't really have an idea but i would like to have some people on their journey with me and i would like to have genuine people on the journey with me and i want to have a really small community it's like i'm saying i have something i want to protect i want to create something that's really intimate that really enables people to go on the on the disaster roller coaster ride with me and the creation ride and so i think that pencil booth is a really low pressure way for me to do that uh so maybe that's a thing i'll commit to that but i I, and i and i don't want to gatekeep it but i also want to gatekeep it so i'm just like the jury's out on that i want it to be people who i feel safe with because i want to feel safe to be myself and i think that that's the most important message that I could kind of leave on. Create whatever safety allows you to be yourself and if an environment or a place isn't allowing you to be that, again, this is from a privileged position, but find a way to be yourself in as many environments and ways as you can. And if that's in your bedroom, listening to music or drawing on a piece of paper, then that's what it is. Just allow more time to drop into who you are. And that way your message will ring with a bell of clarity like no other. And I think if you aren't allowing time for that, you're just adding to the noise and we need less people adding to the noise with opinion. I was going to say something, but I'm not that I'm done. That was amazing. Thank you so much for your time and energy. No worries. Thank you. And guys. It's just been such an absolute joy and gift to be able to connect with you like this. So I appreciate you so much. Thank you for all of that inspiration that you've gifted each listener with. Uh, you were magic. Thanks. It's a bundle of crazy up here, but it's okay. I'm working it out. <laughs> That's the only way I'll, I like it. 